In this lesson, we'll take a look at William Paley's worldview. He was a Christian thinker, and so his understanding of the origin of species is rooted in Christianity. We'll also look at how Charles Darwin will challenge some of this Christian thinking. Now, being a Christian, Paley embraces that metaphor, the world is an artifact. All species on Earth were created by an intelligent mind. Now, it may be that that when humans were created, we got a little something extra special. We are a moral species. Uh, but nevertheless, all species were created by God at some time in the past. And we'll call this the special creation hypothesis. So uh, Paley, being a Christian, is going to argue that each species was separately created by God at some point in the past. And furthermore, that they have not changed since their creation. To see how this works, take a look at this diagram here. We've got three species up here. We've got the giraffe, the chimp, and the human. And each is shown to have a line of ancestry that goes right back to the mind of God. God, being the intelligent designer, created the first of each type of species. So God created the first giraffes and gave them the capacity to make more giraffes. So God made a male and a female, right? So these giraffes then can reproduce and make more giraffes, but notice giraffes only make other giraffes in this view. And why do giraffes only make other giraffes? Because God designed giraffes that way. We can think of the blueprint for making each species as a kind of an essence, and we'll get into what an essence is in a moment. But each species then was created by God, and they only ever made more of their kind. So for chimpanzees today, they always had chimpanzees in their line of ancestry. There was never anything different in the line of ancestry, all the way back to the mind of God. And the same with humans. And so in this worldview, then, the lines of ancestry are parallel because species are not changing. Now, why don't species change? Because they have an essence. And to get to the bottom of what an essence is, let's use a geometric example. Take a look at this circle, the big red circle and then the small green one down here. All circles satisfy the definition of circles. We can say the set of all points equidistant from another point on the plane. So all of these points on the red line here are equally distant from another point on the plane. That's the definition of a circle. And we can think of the definition as the essence. So the essence of a species, then, would be whatever it is that makes it that type of creature. So giraffes have unique characteristics that make giraffes giraffes and not some other type of creature like a zebra or something. And chimps have their own unique characteristics and humans have, we have our own unique characteristics. So importantly though, if, uh, uh, if species have an essence, essences don't change, right? Just as we can think of the definition of a circle doesn't change. It was the same yesterday, it'll be the same tomorrow. Well, if species have an essence, then uh, species cannot change. And of course, if we think about God's intention here, God designed these uh, species to be those species, right? So that from the Christian's point of view, that made complete sense. God made giraffes. God made giraffes to be giraffes, not for giraffes to change into something else. So the lines of ancestry are parallel for Paley because each species was created with an essence and essences can't change, so species can't change. Now, Darwin's going to come along and make a radical change in the lines of ancestry. So you'll notice in this uh, diagram, the lines of ancestry converge at different points in the past. Let's just take the humans and the chimpanzees. Notice the lines converge at this point in the past. So the idea here uh, is that Darwin is suggesting that at some point in the past, there was a species of hairy ape-like creature here that was not a human, not a, a chimpanzee, but that that species, that one species, split into two separate species, and they subsequently changed into the current species that we see today. Right, so clearly then, in Darwin's mind, species cannot have an essence, because species are changing over time. One species here is changing into two separate species. In fact, if we go farther back in time, all three of these species today had a common ancestor. 
So for Darwin, then, we can see a radical difference. Whereas Paley thinks that species are unchanging, each species has an essence. That essence is sort of like the blueprint in the mind of God. God made the first of each type, and then uh, the creatures made more of each other through the process of reduction, uh, reproduction. Darwin's going to argue there is no essence. Species do not have an essence. Species change over time. Now, how do they change? Why does one species split into two? Uh, he's going to argue natural selection is an important part of that answer, and we'll study that in more detail a little later. Now, let's take another look at uh, the Christian thinking com and compare it to Darwin. Uh, people like William Paley, as Christians, looked around the world and they saw animals in possession of what we will call adaptations. So an adaptation would be a feature of a creature that helps it survive and reproduce. For example, the camouflage of this insect is pretty impressive. It looks like a leaf. That would be an adaptation. It's a heritable trait. Its offspring uh, also look like leaves, and that helps them survive. The praying mantis has spikes on its forelimbs. The stick insect is well camouflaged in an environment full of sticks. The giraffe, of course, has the long neck to get food that's high up. The turtles and tortoises have hard shells for predator defense. We've got teeth for ripping flesh and feathers and wings and little um, adaptations on the digits of the gecko to hold on to things. So the world was full of a species, and all of these adaptations give the appearance of design. So for the Christian, the adaptations of creatures is evidence that they were designed by an intelligent mind. In fact, William Paley is going to write about what he calls the design argument. He's going to be comparing a watch to a living organism. Now imagine you were walking down the path and you found this watch. You wouldn't think to yourself that it, it might have you know, sat there for a million years. No. Be, well, why would you not think that? Because it has parts with purpose, right? And so we would naturally conclude that this object must have had an intelligent designer. Why it must have had an intelligent designer? Because it has parts with purpose. The hands move. It has a, a plate with the numbers on it. There are gears inside. And this object then shows evidence of design. What's the evidence? Parts with purpose. Well, when Paley looked at any living thing in the world, he also found parts with purpose. Eyes for seeing, ears for hearing. And we've got the fur, and we've got teeth, and we've got blood and bones and livers, etc. All of these things are parts with purpose. But if this object that has parts of purpose must have had a designer, then so too living organisms must have had a designer. And that's Paley's design argument. He's going to compare these two types of objects. An artifact created by humans, he's going to argue, uh, shares a lot in common with living species. And he's going to then con conclude that this, too, is a kind of artifact. It was created by an intelligent mind. Why do we conclude that? Because it, too, has parts of a purpose. Now, in biology, so we're, we're going to call that the design argument, where he compares the, the watch and the, and the living organism. The parts and purpose in biology are called adaptations. So for the Christian, adaptations are evidence of a designer. When Paley looks around the world and sees all these wonderful species and all their adaptations, he is seeing, in a sense, the mind of God. Many people in his time, many Christians who were studying nature, were doing so to understand God's mind. Now, let's uh, consider another aspect of Paley's thought. <coughs> if we think about this T-Rex here, and it has uh, teeth here, of course those teeth do something useful for the T-Rex. The it rips flesh of its prey. And if we ask, wh where did these teeth come from, for the Christian... That's going to be God, right? So God designed the, the, the teeth and then made the teeth. Now, what does it mean to design? Well, God was thinking about what purpose or what function God wanted to assign to these parts here. In other words, you can think of God saying, okay, I, I need some kind of device that's going to help this animal, help T-Rex tear flesh, right? So, in other words, the tearing flesh would be the purpose or the function. And so God thinks, all right, I need something to tear flesh, and now I'm going to make the sharp tooth, right, to do that. The device will be the animal part, right? So for Paley, 
uh, we can kind of break down the process into two steps. There's the design part, where you think of the function or the purpose, tearing flesh, and then there's the, the making part, the creation part, the production part, where you actually make the animal part, in this case, the sharp tooth. So for Paley, purpose comes first, and then the animal part. Darwin's going to reverse that. Darwin's going to argue that the purpose comes second, and that the animal parts come first. Now, how does he do that? He's going to argue that nature, through the process of reproduction, nature experiments with different animal configurations, different animal parts, we might say. So when animals reproduce, especially through sexual reproduction, the offspring have many differences from their parents. And Darwin used the term variation, so offspring show many variations. Uh, and we can think of this metaphorically as nature experimenting with animals. Now imagine then all these animals struggling for existence, some of them, due to uh, their whatever part they have, might have an advantage over another. And as they kind of struggle for existence, they may sort of discover, metaphorically discover, the function or purpose of some particular variation that they have. Right? And, to, and to see this, we'll, we'll use the example of the mantis. So here we see the praying mantis. It's got to be here, and you can see uh, the spikes on its forelimbs. Now, Christians would say, well, that's an adaptation, and, and God designed those uh, spikes, right? So God uh, thought of the purpose, wanted uh, something to help hold prey, and then God made these spikes to fulfill that purpose. But for Darwin, uh, there's another way to understand this adaptation. So consider this uh, forelimb on the, on the left here. It has the spikes. That's the, the mantis that we see today. But it's possible that uh, the mantis, when it reproduces, it makes offspring that have no spikes. We could think of that as an experiment. In this case, it would be a bad experiment, right? Because uh, presumably the, the mantises that had no spikes would not uh, do as well, would not survive as well as the ones with spikes. So it would lose the struggle for existence. But nevertheless, we're just showing what an experiment would be, that animal reproduction can produce uh, differences in the offspring. In fact, biologists argue the process uh, went the other way. The ancestors would have had the smooth forelimbs, and through reproduction, an experiment occurred, right? a variation where man some uh, offspring started to have little spikes on their forelimbs. They had an advantage. Notice then, for Darwin, it's nature producing different animals with different parts, and then those animals... Uh, discovering the purpose for those parts, or a purpose for those parts. And it's not like they consciously uh, think about this. They just struggle to survive. Cre the mantises with the uh, spikes do better because these spikes help achieve a, pr uh, a function, help do something. They're useful. They help secure the prey. So in that case, then, the purpose of this uh, part here came second. The part came first through the process of reproduction, the experimentation, and the purpose came second. And you'll remember Paley had it the other way around. The purpose comes first, and then the part uh, comes second when God makes the part. Now, <coughs> Paley did not embrace this idea that nature experiments. And he had a, a simple question that deserves an answer. He said, if nature experiments, where are the animals with no spikes? Or where are the individuals? If we're talking about mantises here, if we're talking about sharks, where are the sharks with dull teeth? Right? If we're talking about giraffes, where are the giraffes with short necks? Right? Where are they? If nature is experimenting, we should see these experiments. Uh, that's a fair question. Uh, and we don't really see giraffes with short necks. We don't often see mantises with no spikes. We don't often see sharks with dull teeth. So where are they? Well, Darwin has a ready answer. So nature does experiment, right? Nature does occasionally make individuals with no spikes, in the case of the, uh, the mantis, but they are more likely to die, so we don't see them, right? And so for Darwin, notice what Darwin's doing here. He's saying that this, this struggle for existence, right, is happening all the time in nature, and the reason we don't see a lot of these experiments is because they are failed experiments. They perished in the struggle for existence. Now let's consider another aspect of Paley's thinking. Think about a predator and prey. So the predator has adaptations to help deal with prey, and of course prey would have adaptations to help deal with predators. Right? So the predator might have teeth with which to tear the flesh of the prey. When it eats, it catches it and eats it. Of course the prey might have adaptations to avoid predators. Right? Now for Paley, 
uh, when thinking about how is it that that predator and prey seem to have just the adaptations that are sort of useful for their situation, for Paley, he had to conclude that it was God who made this arrangement. Paley couldn't see how it was that the soft flesh of the prey could somehow cause predators to have just the right animal device, teeth, to deal with that prey or how the teeth in the predators could somehow cause some adaptations in prey to avoid those teeth. Right? Paley couldn't see how each type of creature might be changing the other type. Right? He was missing this idea of a selection process that Darwin would, would uh, champion. For Paley, there must be a third factor that was causing this fit uh, between predators and prey, and that third factor was God. Now, we've learned that Darwin's view uh, involves this interaction of species and how cuckoos and warblers, as they struggle for existence, are changing the other species. Right. So, rem remember when cuckoos uh, entered the parasitic mode of living, right? That, that sets up a problem for the warblers. So, so now we've got some foreign eggs in the nest. Now, warblers that cannot spot the foreign eggs, they are in trouble. They're going to lose the struggle for existence. Those warblers that can detect the foreign egg, so they have good egg recognition, they're going to have more offspring. They're going to win the struggle for existence. So notice the cuckoo is changing, is selecting which warblers survive. But just as uh, the warblers are, are evolving better egg recognition, that's going to be changing the cuckoo population. So as warblers get better at spotting foreign eggs, that puts up, a, that sets up a selection on cuckoos. Those cuckoos that have low mimicry, like very obvious eggs that are different from the warbler eggs, those uh, cuckoos are going to lose the struggle for existence. Cuckoos that have high egg mimicry are going to win the struggle. So the warblers are influencing which cuckoos survive. So just as, as Paley couldn't see how species might be causing changes in each other, Darwin did see that. And that's this, the key to this idea of a selection process, that one species can be selecting who wins the struggle in another species. And those individuals over here in this species can be selecting who wins the struggle in the other species. We call that an evolutionary arms race. But the key element here is a selection process is happening in nature. Yet another uh, concept uh, that was challenged by Darwin is the design argument itself. Recall that Paley argued that uh, uh, species show evidence of design. They're well equipped with adaptations. But, said Darwin, what if we find species that appear to have parts with no purpose or parts that don't work very well? After all, we should expect uh, high-quality work from an intelligent mind like God. And here we have the Galapagos cormorant as an example. It has wings, but it can't fly. And so for Darwin, this poses a challenge to the design argument. We should expect to see parts with purpose. We should not expect to see parts that don't work. Now, of course, that poses a challenge for Darwin. How do we explain this? Well, Darwin does have an answer, and, and it involves the, the natural history of, of species like this, and we'll study that a little later. And finally, Darwin is going to challenge Paley in, in another way. Uh, you'll recall in Paley's view, all species on the planet were created by God, right? They were designed and created by God. But the Christian God was not only an intelligent and powerful God, but it was a good God. And so for Darwin then, when he looked out in nature, uh, you might sort of suspect, well, if everything was produced by a good God, that we would see good behaviors out in nature. But that's not what Darwin saw. So if we think about the the instinct of the male lions to kill the cubs, kill and eat them. We think about the cuckoo bird ejecting the warbler eggs, or the wasp paralyzing its victim and then laying an egg on its victim to be devoured. Um, these behaviors did not strike Darwin as the kinds of behaviors that you would expect from a good god. Uh, so this was yet another way that Darwin was challenging Paley's worldview. Now Paley might have had answers, and, and Christians in general, can have answers to uh, these challenges. For example, you might say, well, uh, there, there is a reason for these types of behaviors, but perhaps we just don't know the, uh, the intention of God here, right? So to conclude that God is not good here would be a mistake. 
Um, likewise with the cormorant. Well, yes, that appears to be a part with no purpose, but maybe it's we just don't understand God's intention here. Uh, and so we have to have faith that there is some reason why God would make uh, a bird with wings that don't work. Nevertheless, uh, Darwin has posed here several challenges to uh, Paley's worldview. So let's recap some of the ways that Darwin and Paley disagree. Paley thinks species have an essence, and as a consequence, they have never changed since creation by God. Darwin's going to argue that species do not have an essence, and in fact they have changed over time. Changed in, in many ways. Uh, so from common ancestors, new species can be evolving. And that means that species do not have an essence. For Paley, adaptations are evidence of design, an intelligent design. And he offers the design argument to persuade us that just as a watch had a designer, the, uh, the cat had to have an intelligent designer as well. For Paley, uh, the purpose comes before the actual animal device. The purpose of the part comes before the part. For Darwin, nature experiments right, uh, with the part, and then the purpose is discovered. So for Darwin, part comes first, and then the purpose is discovered. For Paley, the, the kind of fit or the match between predator and prey was arranged by God. For Darwin, it is a process of selection. Each species is setting up selection pressures on the other. Warblers are influencing which cuckoos survive. Cuckoos are influencing which warblers survive. And that's why we see a sort of a match between these uh, species in nature. For Paley, we should expect well-designed species. For Darwin, evidence of parts with no purpose or that don't work well weakens the design argument. And for Paley, uh, the Christian God was a good God. For Darwin, Darwin begins to wonder how a good God could create creatures that behave in these ways.